I understand you and your brother Tim grew up in Annapolis, Maryland? That's right. How was it, uh, the movie going experience in, in Annapolis, was it? I think it was, um, I think it was normal. I think it was kind of your quintessential small town movie going experience. I, I, that's how I would spend my weekends. I'd go see one, two, maybe three movies a weekend. I was, it was my favorite thing to do. And you know, set, saw everything in a the theater or went to Blockbuster. You know, I think I'm pretty sure every week there were multiple blockbusters in our house, just on a on a cycle. So that was the weekend plan was just sort of movie binge watching. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, and sports and but yeah, movies were a huge part of it. So you came to West Hollywood. I'm not sure if you came there with your brother or or out of college. You came to West Hollywood. And you yeah, got an he was he was here a couple years before me. A year and a half before me, and he went. Uh, he did a year at USC, um, and we both. And I came out right after college, and we both took jobs in the industry. And kind of as we figured out what path we wanted to go and what we wanted to do, and um, pretty early on, we said we're going to do something pretty uh, audacious, and we're going to go out on our own and try to make a movie. And so that was, at the time, it was actually a different film we were trying to get made before Jamesy Boy. And that film, you know, as, you, as it goes, it fell apart. Uh, never really got off to a good start. Uh, but we learned a lot, we met some people along the way, and I don't think Jamesy Boy would have happened without the false start of the previous project. Interesting, but you came out here having done a few short films, yeah. I believe, like five or so you had? I had done um, a number of short films in college and then had made two films, two more shorts when I came out here. So my first couple years out here I was still making shorts. What were the sort of, what was the perception like of what was going to happen to younger guys in an apartment in West Hollywood coming from a smaller town, uh, you know? versus what actually happened. So what were your sort of expectations and then what actually... It's an interesting question. I don't, I don't think I know the answer to that. I <laughs> wish I could go back and think about my mindset, you know, right out of college, but we were always very driven. You know, we were always very um, determined to achieve our goals and our goals were making movies. And so I don't think there was ever a moment where we kind of said, we can't do this. You know, we just looked at everything practically and said, okay, this is the project. We've gotten it creatively there. Now what are the steps that, you know, we need to make to get it made? Um, and that kind of goes with every project we do, whether it's something we're producing, something I'm directing. Um, and so I don't, I don't think there was ever a moment where I had this perception and it wasn't met. Um, but I love it. I mean, I love living out here, and California is very uh, invigorating. And being in this town and this business, you're surrounded by super talented people every day, uh, and it's uh, it's inspiring. I love it. So you and Tim both had industry jobs. Did that leave a lot of time for you to get your production company off the ground? I mean, I know a lot of times in the beginning you're working very very long hours too. Yeah, you know, I think. When we decided that we were going to do this on our own, we quit the industry jobs and we did, um, you know, I picked up odd jobs, tutoring and coaching tennis and other things to pay the bills as we tried to, to build something. Um, and that took a long time. It really took a long time. So let's go back to Jamesy Boy. Did you know the gentleman that the story was about previously? Yeah. Or, oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. He's actually staying with me right now. Oh, wow. He's a really okay. dear friend of mine. Um, the backstory to that is quite amazing because uh, Tim and my mother is a filmmaker as well and uh, a documentarian. And she had done a documentary back in 2001 called If I Could, which focused on James, the subject of Jamesy Boy, years younger, and, her mo and his mother and their family story. Um, and that movie also was a pickup of a story that my mom had covered at CBS News 20 years prior to that. So there's this long progression of this family that we've tracked and told, told their story. And they're really this incredible story. It, people, I mean, they've, they've overcome so much. Um, I mean, James is still one of my inspirations and he's a 
immensely talented filmmaker today himself, um, doing a lot of really exciting work. But uh, yeah, so I knew James, and so I was close. At the time that I started developing the script, I wasn't close with him. The process of doing the script brought us really close together. When did you start? Is it Star Thrower Productions? Yeah. So when did you Star Thrower Entertainment? Yeah. And Entertainment. I'm sorry. Um, we started that officially uh, probably about six years ago, but it existed prior. The name existed. The the idea of it existed, um, just not as formally as it does today. Um, but yeah, we started it about five and a half, six years ago, and with a focus on development. Um, we wanted to to develop projects from inception, uh, hire writers, give ideas birth, and, and then take them out to package and look for financing and, you know, the traditional producing route. Um, and so that's what Star Thrower started as, and it's still to this day what it, the company is primarily focused on. Do you mind if I ask how much money does it take to start a, a film production company? I mean, you're taking these odd jobs, your tennis lessons in the afternoon. Sure. <laughs> um, it's not quite as easy to, to pin one number on it. It takes enough to, um, to back up, you know, to hire writers. Really, that's what it took. It took enough to, to go out there and be able to hire writers and on ideas that you believe have viability um, and that you believe you can get there. Uh, and so that's what we did. That's really how the company started. I want to talk about Crooked Somebody in just a second, but I, I wanted to ask you about, you said there was another project that didn't get made that Jamesy Boy ended up getting made that you learned from. Mm -hmm. What were those lessons that maybe saved you with Jamesy Boy that cost you with the other film? It's a great question. Um, a lot of it had to do with understanding uh, budget. You know, they're, they're, that movie required something larger. It required a bigger presence in as a first time filmmaker and a young one at that um, with a script. The script had won the Nickel Fellowship, so it was something that was out there and it was a really beautiful script. Talented writer wrote it. Um, but it, we believed it had commercial viability because it felt like a big broad movie that you could see on many theaters when in actuality I think independents are better served when they offer counter programming to what the studios are offering and so we just really found it hard to attach talent and to raise money and I think when we looked at the time when we were looking inward we were saying this is too far of a mountain to, to climb and we said okay if we do this again and start over, how do we choose a subject matter that um, is grittier, feels like it works in that independent space, that can be produced for less money? Um, so those were all the things we kind of factored into that equation. So maybe too ambitious of a budget and realize that it was more about story and focusing? I think so. I think it needed too much to get that made for a first timer. And not to, not to mention, you know, it takes place on an island and 20% of the movie was out on a sailboat and it, all these things that really would have been tough for an experienced filmmaker, let alone someone who'd never done a feature. And you were sort of the co-writer of Jamesy Boy? A uh, co-writer of Jamesy Boy, yes, mm -hmm. not of the original. Right, right. Okay. But I don't see writing as a, I don't think I'm a great writer. I, th I, think, um, I think there are better writers out there to execute a vision or an idea. So what drew you to Crooked Somebody? What, what was the, how did you hear about it? Script. Um, so Rich Summer and I had done a movie the prior summer uh, together that I had produced called LBJ. And Rich was in that and um, we became good buddies on that set. And he was telling me about an idea that he had for a movie. And his best friend from college, Andy Zilch, Andrew Zilch, who, who wrote the script, um, was writing it for Rich. And Rich said, look, I'd love for you to just read it and give me notes. Um, we, we are excited about this thing. We want to know if we have anything on our hands and I trust your opinion. And so I said, of course, whenever you're ready with the script, send it. Um, about a month and a half later, he called me and said, remember that script I was talking about? Well, it's done. I'd love to share it with you. And I read about 20 pages and I called up my brother and I said, Tim, 
Rich Summer just sent me the script and it is awesome. It is so fun. I'm so into this thing. I'm gonna send it to you now. I'm gonna keep reading, but you should read it too. And we read it that night. And um, you know, Rich was expecting just to get notes back. I don't think he was expecting me to call him back and say, we wanna produce it and I, also I wanna direct it. <laughs> um, so I, I said, look, Rich, I, I love this. I absolutely love this thing in every way, shape and form. Would you consider not only us coming on to produce it, but would you be open to me directing this thing? I'd, I'd love to direct it. I've been looking for my next movie. And Rich, uh, you know, at that point, I think he was excited by the idea, but wanted to talk to Andy. And so we all got together. We talked about it, about what, you know, the themes of the film and, and why we wanted to, why I wanted to tell the story and how. Uh, and I think they felt comfortable and we got together. That's how we did that. So I know you were part of uh, Ingrid Goes West as well, mm -hmm. another film that I love. Thank um, you. And, and both films, without giving away too much about Crooked Somebody, deal with uh, something that's very relevant today, and that is, uh, without go going too deep into it, just, or just the, the need for notoriety, I guess you could say, um, and, and whether it's f to speak out about something that's very real and needs to be addressed, or on the other hand, there's all sorts of trickery involved in today's landscape. So, and we're in this new thing where we can't tell what's real yet. And sort of it's like this trial by Twitter that we're essentially as a public engaging in. Yeah. So, so I'm just curious, what is that something that's, oh, you know, you've, you've grown up sort of near D.C. and as you know, it's a very different town than L.A. in some ways, maybe sometimes similar. What I would <laughs> say to this question is um, I think you're absolutely right. I think there are certainly parallels between Ingrid Goes West and Cricket Somebody in terms of the character of Ingrid and the character of Michael Vaughn. Um, you know, two people who need that affirmation that, you know, they are of value of some sort. You know, Michael Vaughn wants fame and fortune. It's what he's dreamt of. But, but the question why is a deeper question. I think the movie hopefully touches on those reasons. It does. Um, same with Ingrid. I think Ingrid is a really, you know, beneath the surface of all the Instagram chats and the fun kind of nature of the movie, I think there's a really... Uh, honest portrayal of someone who's sick. Um, the next part of your question is, uh, yes, it's, a, it's apparent all over. It's certainly apparent in Washington, D.C. Uh, that has no reason why we wanted to tell these movies. In fact, we typically, you know, we love a good political movie, as you can tell by LBJ or The Post, for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, Excellent. Both. We grew up in D.C. I think those films speak more to those instincts of ours than Ingrid or Crooked. But, um, but yeah, we, we. I think maybe the proximity to to where we grew up, to, to Washington D.C., maybe had an influence on the kinds of stories we want to tell. I just don't know if I would say that Ingrid and Crooked were were uh, influenced by it. Okay, interesting. Going back to West Hollywood, uh, the apartment and having these industry jobs, I'm wondering if you can take us through each challenge you had to overcome to start the production company, maintain it, kind of like what were those hurdles? Um, and then at some point, do you become a threat to other production companies and you've got to sort of protect yourself? I mean, there's all these different things that happen with growing pains. Yeah, I mean, the. It's hard to get into the specifics. I don't think our interview is nearly long enough to go into the, to the specifics of that. But um, there were certainly times that I think Tim and I felt like our backs were against the wall. And there were times where we thought about, do we just throw in the towel? Do we throw in the towel on this thing and you know, go find jobs elsewhere? Which would have been a perfectly suitable option. It would have been hard to accept, I think, just given the amount of sweat and love we'd put into this thing. But, um, but there was just this belief, this underlying belief that we could do it, we could pull this off. And we believed in our abilities to um, develop good screenplays and to um, be able to put movies together. I think a little blindly, maybe, uh, blindly ambitious, because if I were giving advice to someone in my shoes, you know, seven, eight years ago, I don't know if I would tell them to do my path. I think it's a, I think it's a hard path, and it requires just as much luck as it does skill. 
I think some people know whether they're made to be, and I don't mean to have this be condescending, but employees, whether they can, they can take a life of being a worker, mm -hmm. and whether some people are just like, I just can't do that. It's not that it's not honorable, I just can't do that. And so if you're willing to stay with the challenges, and I'm sure there was a lot of time when you're spending alone, and it, I know entrepreneurship can become very lonely, mm -hmm. and in a sense, that's basically what it is, even though it's in a creative I think space. I was really lucky to have my brother as my partner on that, you know, because at the time that we started the company, we were also living together. And um, so we had each other to really rely on and, and challenge. I mean, um, you know, you're most honest with your family, right? So uh, it, it wasn't constantly, oh, this is great. Yes, this is great. <laughs> we really challenged each other, and I think that made us better at the job. And, um, you know, I think for us, I should speak really for me, because my brother's a different person, but I, it didn't matter to me the path. It, the result was far more important. I wanted to be making movies. I wanted to be directing movies. I wanted to be producing movies. I wanted to be a part of that process. Um, and to this day, it's the most gratifying thing I could ever dream of. I, I can't imagine I'll ever fall out of love with this job. How do you balance your duties with the, the films with your brother? Like, is he good at one thing and vice versa? Well, we, you know, there's a couple of us at the company and, you know, I think it's, the, the balancing of time I think is the hardest part because there's never enough time to do everything you want to do. And I think, um, you know, there's no world in which you're going to say, all right, these are two or three projects and that's all I'm focusing on. I'm going to put all my energy into these two or three projects and expect those two or three projects to, to happen. Um, it's just unrealistic. You know, for us, it's about having more quantity, still quality, but, but having um, the ability to go out and try to package several things and get out there because not everything's going to work and the marketplace won't, won't deem everything a, a project of value. So. Um, it's about how do we keep uh, ideas coming into the company and having the time to read them, read the books, read the articles, the scripts, meet with the writers, uh, simultaneously prepping a movie, shooting a movie, posting a movie. So, um, and sometimes, you know, in the case of Ingrid and Crooked, they were overlapping. Um, and so it can be challenging. What do you want people to take from Crooked Somebody? I know you had said off camera that there were some interesting character arcs. Those are, without giving away too much of the ending, but it, there's a very su sort of surprising look at good and bad. Yeah, there is. Um, I think what drew me to the two kind of key figures in the movie was that their character arcs kind of move in reverse order uh, and unexpectedly. Uh, and I thought that was really unique. Um, but what do I want people to, to, to get out of this? It's funny, in my first movie, in Jamesy Boy, I really wanted it to be like this emotional punch. And I think I tried for that. And I might have missed the mark a little bit on it. So with this, I really wanted to not have that weight. And I just wanted this to be a fun time. I wanted you to not know where the story was going and to just enjoy the entire experience of watching it. And, that was kind of the number one focus as making it. Not trying to do too much or say too much, but just provide entertainment. And, you know, jury's out on if we, we did that. For any of the titles that you've been attached to, whether it's as a producer, director, what is your process for getting people attached from crew, talent? Uh, it's a great question. And uh, I can tell you that every film that I've been a part of has had a different uh, everything's slightly different, um, but I can tell you the most traditional uh, path that we look at and that we try to implement, and that's start with the idea, right? So there's an idea that's either hatched in-house or from a writer that we want to work with, a writer that we know will mesh with our sensibilities. Um, we hire that writer, we collaborate with them. You know, that process can be anywhere from six months to a year, um, sometimes longer than a year, depending on how much work 
is needed to get the script into the right place. When the script is ready, then we go out to the you know, talent agencies and we have the actors of our dream, we have the directors of our dream. If I'm not directing it, we look at who are the filmmakers out there that uh, could really do this film justice. Simultaneously, we're looking at the budget, you know, because we have to think about uh, what does this film want to be made for? What should it be made for? What can it be made for? They're all very different things. And so there's a range. And, you know, something we look at is if a movie is scalable in that sense, right? Is there a version of this movie that is great at 10 million, but the same script with different people involved, could it be made for 25 million? So we look at that and we think about all of those factors and then we approach um, the filmmakers, the talent, the actors, the director. Uh, usually it's director first and then we bring on actors um, with, in conjunction with the director's thoughts. And then, um, then we have a package and we go get money, you know? And there's many different sources for how you do that. Um, sometimes the money comes to you, which is nice. And then you go make the movie. Um, and that's the point where, you know, you start hiring all your key positions. And uh, the more and more we make, the more relationships we've, you know, part, uh, key crew that we want to bring from another movie back onto this one because we've built relationships there. We trust. The trust is there. Um, and oftentimes we work with new collaborators, and that's exciting as well. And then the movie wraps, and then we see it all through post-production, through the editorial and visual effects and sound design and scoring. And then it's about getting the movie out there to the world. Um, if it's an independent w without distribution, it's festivals and who are the right buyers and that sort of route. And if it's a studio film like The Post, you go into production knowing your start date, you go in knowing where it's going, when it's going, and and how it's going, and so they're two different beasts. Lastly, what do you see mistakes as new directors uh, make, whether they're overly eager on set, they're nervous, they're afraid to approach cast and crew? What are some of the mistakes, whether they were ones that you made in the beginning or that you just see from other people that are green, so to speak? I think the best advice I would give to a filmmaker, that I, a first-time filmmaker that I'm working with, is you got to this point because you have a clear vision. Stay true to that vision. And I think it's very easy with running over budget or actors not wanting to do things certain ways and the challenges of actually physically making the movie can get in the way of accomplishing that vision. Uh, and so as you begin to make compromises, it's important to keep that in mind um, and I think young filmmakers often veer from it and then they lose the tone and the feel of their film um, so that's kind of the best advice I would give you know you have such a, an incredible body of work like all the films that you've been involved with I, I haven't seen uh, James E. Boy forgive me I would like no, to see okay. it but I mean they're all films that I would recommend to other people are you very selective with what you take on it, you have a great body of work we thank you um, we're far more selective now than we were. I think at the start of, like any company, you need, you need projects. You need to be making stuff. Um, you need to feed the, the animal. Um, now we're fortunate enough to be in a position where, you know, we are incredibly selective. We won't, you know, we could have five movies come that say, will you come on to this and produce it? They're go movies. They're happening. I, I don't think we would jump onto those unless we absolutely love it and feel like we provide value to the project. Um, you know, I think we tend to want to be more actively involved in a project than passively. So I think, you know, hence why we like to develop our own material, why we like to kind of control it and control how the movie comes together. Um, and then sometimes the movie kind of goes out of your hands a bit, but comes together miraculously like The Post, which was, you know, for someone who idolized as an understatement uh, as a kid, Steven Spielberg, I, you know, had a poster of him on my wall. Um, it was the dream of a lifetime, getting to sit beside him as he directed and watch him and learn from him. So, you know, there are always fun moments involved.
I know The Post is a film that is very timely right now. And yeah. Won't go into some of the reasons why, but um, can you talk about making it and just the process of seeing it? Sure. Well, when we started developing that script with Latana, um, we didn't know that the film was going to be as relevant as it became. You know, this was pre the election. It was actually at a time when we thought we were going to have our first female president. And we thought, this is a movie that's about female empowerment and about a woman finding her voice. And we thought it was relevant in that way. Um, little did we know that it was about to be relevant in a whole nother way. Um, and I think what was amazing about that, and, and you know, we still have to pinch ourselves that it happened in the way that it did, is most movies don't you know, get greenlit, have a start date two months later with a release date six months after that in time for Oscar season. You know, so it was very much when, it, when the green light came, it was a kind of a stunning moment. Um, Seeing it maybe the, the, in a big theater, just with the cast well, and crew? The first time I saw it was actually in a small theater. I saw it um, at Amblin, at Stephen's office, in his private screening room. And it was, um, I mean, it was just one of the most incredible experiences, I think, of my life, uh, especially in my career, just watching this thing that, you know, we spent every day watching how Steven worked and where his mind was going with decisions and then seeing it so effortlessly and beautifully come together. And, and then to see our company name up there and their credits, it was just like, this is a dream. This is a childhood dream. Um, never thought it would happen, so it was emotional. How did you attach uh, Steven Spielberg, or how did you approach him? Well, I should say uh, <laughs> we didn't. Um, you know, the script had kind of taken on a life of its own. It had become quite a, uh, a popular script in town, and um, at that point, there were many uh, buyers involved that wanted it and wanted to take it off the table, and uh, it ultimately went to Amy Pascal, who, you know, was in her new post as a producer after having run Sony for a long time. And uh, Amy was incredibly gracious and collaborative and um, couldn't have been a better partner on the project. And with Amy, we then set it up at Fox. And then together, it was one of these questions. I remember the first time we talked about directors and Steven Spielberg's name came up and it was, he's doing another movie and he's in, that's the long shot of all long shots. So we kind of just didn't think about it. And then Amy received an incoming call that said, Steven's movie is gonna push. And Tom and Merrill, we wanna send it to all three of them at the same time. And it was on a Friday afternoon that we got that call. And by Monday, all three had read it and wanted to do it. What was that weekend like? Actually not bad because we thought it was so far-fetched. We, we didn't think it was in the realm of possibility. I mean, we get calls all the time on projects of, oh, so-and-so, let's send it to them. And, you know, and nine out of 10 times, it doesn't pan out. So I think we never thought that the Monday call was going to come the way it did. So the, I didn't think about it much over that weekend. But then when we heard it, it was like, a, you know, took your breath away.